Rutgers. I'm the director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for the Humanities here at Rutgers Camden, also known as MARCH. Um, at Rutgers Camden, we are a campus committed to scholarship and civic engagement, and therefore we are very happy to host this event, which is a perfect fit with our mission and the work we do here. So our goal today is to create some time and some space to focus on the practice of history. And most of all, to enable some conversations, to spark new scholarship, new partnerships, more collaborations for the future of our national parks. And we have in the room people who work for national parks. We have people who work at universities around the region. Uh, we have students here from Rutgers Camden and other universities, which is terrific because one of the goals also is to begin to cultivate the next generation of, of national parks um, historians and custodians. We, uh, we would like to acknowledge the um, partners we have in this event on your program. We have um, listed a number of offices at Rutgers Camden that have helped us. Of course, the National Park Service Northeast Region. I would like to um, say a special word about my planning partners, uh, Barbara Polarine and Christine Arado. We have had some um, anxious moments, as you might imagine, in the last month or so. Um, so we are delighted that this event is occurring um, today. We also have two terrific program assistants who have helped us. Um, who actually might still be out on the registration desk, um, but I want to mention uh, Mandy Magnuson Hung and Chris Constantine. Is Chris in the room? Yes, they're all out busy doing their work um, for, for their work because they really put this together and the rest of us can enjoy the fruits of their effort. So we're going to bin, begin today with some um, words of welcome from two distinguished historians uh, from Rutgers Camden and from the National Park Service. And I have to say, one of the great joys of working at Rutgers Camden is not only do we have a history department, but our dean is a historian, and she's here. Christy Lindenmeyer is sitting up here in the front, and say hello, Chris. Um, and our chancellor is a historian. So you're going to be hearing um, from the leader of our campus, Wendell Pritchett. Our second welcome will be from the chief historian of the National Park Service, Bob Sutton, who, as most of you know, has had a long and wide-ranging career in the, in the Park Service, including some time at Independence, um, and before his previous position as superintendent of the Manassas National Battlefield Park. Um, so first, I welcome Wendell Pritchett to the podium. Good afternoon. Uh, so I first want to welcome you all to campus. It's such a pleasure to have you here. It's a beautiful day. Apologize there aren't any windows on this room, but you'll have a little break time to actually see, see the beautiful day, but there'll be a lively discussion here, I'm certain. Um, and I also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Charlene Mars for all of her work in putting this together. So thank you, Charlene. And also acknowledge my, my colleague, uh, Chris Lindenmeyer, who is also a historian. We are both consider ourselves public historians uh, of American history. So we are, we are happy to be here with you today. Um, unfortunately, my schedule doesn't allow me to be here for a lot of today, which is actually disappointing to me because this is fun stuff as opposed to dealing with parking issues or the other things that I, <laughs> I deal with on a daily basis. Um, but it really is a pleasure to have you. So um, my job was to welcome you, and I've just done that. However, I hope you will indulge me just for a couple of minutes to share a story, um, which I hope will help in, in, you know, give, give you at least a light, some lightness to start the day with um, and, and, and uh, help move along the discussion. Uh, so I am proud to be a member of the history department of uh, the Rutgers Camden. Uh, and uh, all of us historians have a own, our own personal stories about how we became historians, right? We really, we all do. Most academics do, but all of us historians have. Uh, so let me quickly tell, tell you mine. Uh, I grew up uh, right across the river, uh, three blocks from the Liberty Bell in Independence Place in a neighborhood that's known as Society Hill. My parents moved there in 1967 when it was just coming back as, as a neighborhood. Uh, and as a result, uh, one of the formative moments in my life uh, was the Bicentennial. Uh, I was 12 years old for the Bicentennial. Uh, and so everybody in our family and our group of friends wanted to come see Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell during the Bicentennial. Um, and having two parents who are academics, they're both high school teachers, uh, we developed our own tour. So me and my mother developed a tour that we, we, we actually had a script um, and each one of us had lines and we had, we had a tour that we followed and we did it at least 10 times that summer. Uh, and, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and so my mother and I still joke about this today that you know, that's when I became a historian. Uh, and, and I'm very proud of that fact. So, so I share that story with you to help you know, 
rem remind you of something that you already know, which is that the parks uh, are a treasure that we have in this country and that they have a gigantic impact on all of us. Um, my parents still live there for 46 years later, and I never miss an opportunity to drive past the Independence Hall, and I never miss an opportunity to uh, enjoy all of the people enjoying uh, all of those uh, monuments and uh, and I've really been impressed uh, as I've taken people there over the years of how increasingly sophisticated the representation of that history has become uh, and it's 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 really something that we should be proud of now obviously there's lots more work to do um, and that's why you're joined here today uh, and certainly I, I do need to bring us down for a moment and focus on the fact that there are nowhere near the amount of resources uh, that we should have to do this work considering how crucial it is and how influential it is but you know the, the what I always say to my staff is do a good job and the rewards will come now I have to tell you we know that isn't always true in life but let's let's believe it let's believe it for today let's believe it for today that we should if we continue to do a good job and we are doing a good job and as the father of a 13 year old and a 6 year old who are also budding historians we never miss an opportunity my wife also was a history major in college we never miss an opportunity to stop by a park wherever we're going um, and and we all know this because we all do this people love our park system people love understanding our history this is something that we take very seriously as Americans so even though so we, you, don't get the credit that you deserve and the resources that you deserve. Please do know how important the work that you're doing is and how important the conversation that we're having today is. Um, so that's my own uh, editorial and I will now sit down and welcome up uh, Professor Sutton. But I just wanted to welcome you here again and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Well, I bring welcome from the National Park Service, and I guess I should sit down too, but <laughs> I'm a historian, so I can <laughs> the same thing. Um, and what I want to, just to, very briefly, um, on all the tables here, you'll see a, either a book or a or flyer on a study that we did uh, several years ago. With We have a cooperative agreement with the Organization of American Historians, and we, we commissioned a survey uh, for the practice of history in, in the National Park Service. Um, it was, uh, it was a, for us, a really big thing. And part of the reason that we wanted to do this was because uh, we had found from another study several years earlier that uh, at the, about the time this survey was completed, 70% of all historians in the National Park Service either would have been retired or eligible to retire. So we thought it was about time to, to find out what we were doing and, and where we should go in, uh, off in the future. Um, we have about 180, at the time, about 180 historians in the National Park Service, but we want to do this survey and catch everybody in the Park Service who either had training in history or were working as historians in parks. And so we identified about 1,500 in the Park Service in that category, sent the survey out, um, about a, a third, about over 500 responded, which is actually pretty good for a, for a survey, especially when it's open-ended. And the, the historians who, who conducted the survey um, came up with, with 12 findings and 12 recommendations. Some were more complicated than others. Um, they found that we were doing a really good job in some areas. For example, um, Civil War battlefields um, for several years before they did the survey were expanding their interpretation of the Civil War to talk about a little bit more than who shot who, where, when, and how, to talk about the causes of the Civil War, uh, the impact on families, the aftermath, and so forth. Um, there were some other parks that were doing some really good things with media, you know, reaching out beyond the, the park boundaries. Uh, and many new parks were really using civic engagement um, to work with the local publics, with the local communities, to find out what they expected from their park. And some parks um, had, like here, had a wonderful uh, connection with local academics with the academic community um, and some parks actually were teaching graduate courses in their parks so we had some things that we were doing well but the the report found that while we had some of these things that we were doing well there were a lot of things that we weren't doing well and so what we've been trying to do over the last several years is address as many of these recommendations and findings as we could so um, one of the recommendations which was absolutely valid was that we should replace every historian that retires that would be great. We'd love to do that. But right now, we're not replacing a lot of people in any area that, that are leaving the Park Service. They also suggested that we should um, replace all the old, out-of-date interpretive media. That would be great, too. 
but under this current um, economic situation, it's rare. It happens, but it's rare. So what we tried to do was to focus on the things that we thought we could deal with immediately. So one of the, one of the I think the first recommendation um, was that they found that there was a, and we sort of knew this, but we didn't know the extent, that there's a real divide between historians and interpreters in the National Park Service. Um, historians do their work, interpreters do their, their work, but they found that there really wasn't much of a, of a cohesion between um, both divisions. Um, so what we started to do was to look around at some of, the, some of the areas, some of the regions that were doing really good work getting historians and interpreters together to try to balance that um, in other parks. Um, so we've had a lot of good collaboration and uh, over the last year uh, we published a book on American Indians in the Civil War. Uh, the historic, historical side, we got the top scholars to write essays. From the interpretive side, we um, had a, it's a really spectacular book because it has the best interpretive everything in it. Um, and also this region um, recently published a book on the War of 1812. Um, again, the academics and the interpreters got together to produce this. Um, also, many of, the, many of our historians were complaining that there just weren't very many opportunities for, for training or for development. And unfortunately, there's just not a lot that we can do to send everybody to conferences. Um, but what we're trying to do, and, and my colleague Lou Ann Jones will talk about this in just a moment, is to develop um, academies. So um, we can do distance learning, provide distance learning for historians. Um, that we think will be very beneficial and she'll, I'm not going to get into that because she'll tell you a lot more about it in just a few minutes. Also, um, what we've tried to do is find um, programs where there's some subsidy um, but we can provide funding. So actually, as we're speaking, there's, there are four historians attending a historical uh, seminar, historical administration seminar in Indianapolis and we were able to, to scrounge enough money to pay for their tuition and their travel. Uh, we're trying to find something, there's a program in Stanford this summer that um, we would, we're gonna try, well, all we need to do is provide transportation, so we're trying to do that. So what we're trying to do is find ways to um, uh, help our historians and our interpreters with training. There's also another, uh, Gilder Lehrman Institute is a program uh, that has about 40 uh, seminars during the summer and uh, they actually provide two slots at every one of these for Park Service people, so we're trying to encourage all of our Park Service people to apply for that as well. Now, this, this uh, survey, uh, Imperial Promise, and on all the tables you'll see hard copies of it and there are little uh, sort of sheets that, talk, that have the recommendations on it, and I, re I suggest you look at it. But for this to be successful, for us to have success with this program, Really, it depends mostly on the regions and the parks. I mean, we can do some things from the Washington office, but the regions and the parks really are the ones that, that carry the water on this. And I've got to say, the Northeast region has really been in the leadership with this. Um, Christine Arado, the regional historian, um, has helped us put together um, a, a charter for a history um, advisory group, which we hope to get going soon, which will be very helpful. Um, and uh, I think. The most, one of the most important things is to sponsor meetings like this one today where we bring together people from academia and people from the Park Service to have a conversation. So again, thank you and welcome and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. So I'm, I'm the Christina Rado that Bob spoke about, uh, and um, he called me the regional historian. I actually have a little bit of a, a confusion personally about my actual title, uh, which we can explore later, especially in the discussions of historical expertise. But um, my job now, or my task now, is to introduce Luann Jones, which is quite a pleasure. Um, she's a talented historian and a beloved colleague whose career weaves in and out of academic and public history, and she's done a wonderful job of knitting communities together. And I know that sounds like a eulogy uh, when she's in the room, um, but I really feel, uh, having been in the Park Service for 12 years, she's breathed a whole um, new life into the spirit of collaboration amongst park units, different programs, and now with academia. So it really is uh, such a pleasure to introduce her to um, those of you who haven't met her. 
Dr. Jones, or Luann as I like to call her, I don't think she stands on ceremony, uh, taught at the University of Florida and Eastern Carolina, Uni Carolina University before joining the Park Service in the um, Park History Program, which is our Washington-based program. She's the co-author with um, Bob Sutton of the recently published Robert Smalls of South Carolina's Sea Islands, as well as um, a real page turner, uh, Mama Learned Us to Work, Farm Women in the New South. Um, she's a wonderful historian, dynamic person, and without further ado, I'll turn you over to Luann. Um, thank you, Christine. Uh, um, I want to thank Christine. She's been one of my key mentors since I came to the Park Service almost five years ago. And I, I think she's really taken me under her wing to help me figure out um, how to um, be an effective historian in the Park Service. I, I hope I am. Um, I also want to thank the Northeast um, region of the Park Service and March for sponsoring this event and this um, opportunity for us to come together. And for me, it's a great opportunity to meet some of my colleagues in the Northeast region who I've only talked to over the phone or exchanged emails with. So it's, um, it's very wonderful. Um, I think it's safe to say that imp Imperiled Promise is an ambitious report. Um, every time I read it, I come away with new insights, and I think it's, um, it, it, it's a stellar piece of research, and many of the recommendations are quite wise. Um, to my mind, there are four key points or categories um, that stick with, with me when I think about the recommendations. Um, the first, as Bob has uh, alluded to, is that history practitioners and the, and the National Park Service are an eclectic group. Um, in fact, few of us are called historians. And so you might find us as interpreters, uh, cultural resources program managers um, in any number of places. And you might find people who um, are not <coughs> formally trained historians doing the work of uh, the history practice. Uh, I think another point is that whoever we are as history practitioners, and we need to develop professionally throughout our careers. And it might take a lot of work, but I think that's the challenge to us. And I think that that professional development takes different forms depending on who we are. Uh, for novices, professional development may take the form of obtaining fundamental skills in doing historical research or the habits of historical thinking. Uh, for those of us who are seasoned historians, I think it's imperative for us to remain current with new trends in historical scholarship um, and new ways of thinking. Um, or we need, <coughs> need to continue to learn how to better use new technologies, uh, social media, et cetera, uh, to reach old and new audiences alike. We also need to build bridges, both within the Park Service um, and outside the Park Service, certainly within the bridges between history and interpretation and outside the par Park Service with our uh, academic and public history allies. Uh, we all have much to learn from each other. Um, and finally, with a strong foundation in historical thinking, <clears throat> I think we can practice history with more confidence. And when we are more confident history practitioners, we are better able to let go, <coughs> excuse me, of some of our authority, as one of the current phrases is today, of letting go, and invite our constituents into a conversation about the past that speaks to the imperatives of civic life in the 21st century. So today I want to talk about two broad-based efforts that I think promise to um, address several of the uh, authors' concerns about what they call historical expertise in today's workforce, the history interpretation divide, um, a, work, a history workforce for the future, fixed and fearful interpretation, and civic engagement, history and interpretation. Um, the first is what we call the History Initiative, a part of that Academy for Cultural Resources that the Park Service's Division of Learning and Development is spearheading. Uh, most of that curriculum for, uh, will be online or a blend of online and residential learning, and it will be self-directed and asynchronous for the most part, and yet we'll use social media and an online commons to link learners in real time. A second initiative is part of a call to action, the agency's strategic plan as we head toward our centennial in 2016. So I'll talk about the history initiative first. Um, and uh, Christine and I are um, co-partners in, in both of these efforts. Um, our initial planning meeting came at a fortuitous time. It was in May of 2012, and it was just a month after the official launch of Imperiled Promise. 
Uh, the gathering brought together for four days of conversation, reflection, and strategizing some 20 Park Service history practitioners. We included field interpreters, historians, cultural resource program managers, and archaeologists, and superintendents. Um, as coordinators, Christine and I seized that opportunity to use Imperial Promise as a touchstone as we evaluated the current state of history learning and development, identified essential skills and best practices for history practitioners, and began designing um, a, a vigorous uh, uh, curriculum for, um, for historians. Um, two of the report's authors, Ann Mitchell Wisnett and Marla Miller, were among the team that week, and they have remained very engaged and active partners ever since. Our conversation revolved around um, three central themes or central questions. Who were the audiences for the History Initiative and what were their needs? What um, were, are the skills and ways of thinking that learners will have mastered by the end of the course of study? What exemplary materials already exist to help employees learn about the roles of history and the historian in parks and partner programs? Um, and so we left there that week uh, having determined that we had uh, three key audiences, uh, we had established three small working groups and we had begun to outline courses. And so here's what we've um, uh, accomplished so far. And I think that we see great potential uh, as we develop this curriculum. So we've begun to develop um, the script um, uh, for three sets of courses. And these courses are called Foundations of History, NPS 101, and History for Managers. I'll tell you a little bit about each. Uh, foundations of History, which I'm helping to create, is comprised of three courses. Um, and these foundations courses are really designed to meet the needs of those many employees who have history-related duties but have little or no formal training in history. Um, and they are not yet in managerial positions. So we could envision a vast array of people who could be taking uh, the foundations courses. Um, and we also envision curators, anthropologists, archaeologists, archivists, and other cultural resources colleagues who may have collateral duties as historians. These courses will introduce the basics of historical thinking and the fundamentals of historical research using electronic resources, what are primary and second, secondary sources, understanding historiography. Um, it, they will explain what historians do and the kinds of questions we ask. Um, and these courses will encourage students to think about how historical thinking applies to them and their work um, and to explore why history matters. The, um, the Foundation two courses we envisioned as more topical, content-driven courses um, and, um, and also continue the practice in historical thinking. So the co topics could be whatever um, we um, determine the Park Service needs for them to be. Civil War and Emancipation, um, Memory and Moralization, Women's History, History of Capitalism, uh, African American History, um, and on and on. Um, but how we envision this is that even though the topics might differ, um, that we'd like to structure this, the courses very similarly so that even as people might be taking different topical courses that they can be in conversation with each other because they're doing very similar um, uh, exercises in there, such as um, evaluating primary sources and so on. And then um, the third course in this foundation series would be a kind of capstone course, one that would bring the threads together and ask um, students to do a project such as an outline for an exhibit or um, a new interpretive uh, presentation, for example. Um, I think initially we viewed this foundations one through three as um, on an undergraduate model. Um, and we drew kind of a pyramid that mimicked with the foundations, one course down here, uh, upper, the equivalent of upper division courses here, and then the capstone at the top. Um, but I think that what we finally realized is that rather than, we're, we're not an undergraduate um, history department, uh, and that what we really needed to look for was a model for adult learners. And I think that what we are beginning to look for towards or the kinds of public programs that the National Endowment for the Humanities develops for adult learners. These programs often build lessons around films, short readings and pr of primary and secondary sources and facilitated discussions by a scholar. Um, and no doubt for these courses, we will be seeking collaborations with academic and public history partners and public humanities scholars. Um, the second group, uh, which Christine is uh, a lead on, is uh, NPS 101. 
And this, these courses will introduce learners to how history is practiced within the agency. Um, the audience for this might be somebody like me who came into the Park Service with advanced degrees, but a fairly um, naive understanding of how history was actually practiced within the agency. Um, it will be um, park professionals, technicians, managers. And we also envision um, that part of the audience for this will be uh, people outside of the National Park Service, graduate students, contractors, who want to understand the peculiarities of how and why the, the National Park Service does history. So uh, some of the topics that will be addressed here, um, who are the history practitioners in the Park Service, where are they located organizationally, geographically, what products do they produce, um, what is a historic structures report, what is a National Register nomination, an administrative history, uh, cultural landscapes report. What are the specific tools that an NPS historian needs to know how to use? What are cooperative agreements? Uh, how do you write contracts? How do you coordinate a peer review process? Um, and also, uh, how do we uh, build bridges between historians and interpreters and integrate each other's work? And finally, how do Park Service historians stay fresh as scholars? Um, earlier this year at the OAH, Organization of American Historians annual meeting, Christine and um, Elaine Jackson Rotondo, who's the acting regional historian in the Pacific West region, conducted the first NPS 101 workshop, uh, which is one of the recommendations from Imperial Promise, and no doubt it won't be the last time that we offer that workshop. Um, the third uh, cluster of curriculum for um, for the History Initiative is history for managers, and Bob is part of that, as are a couple of uh, superintendents who, have, uh, who are historians. And I, I, as I was reviewing Imperial Promise today and thinking about these courses that are aimed towards superintendents and managers, I was reminded of how important these, um, these efforts will be, because as the report um, uh, reminds us, superintendents have so much um, power in terms of how history will be um, interpreted or uh, the um, seriousness with which it will be treated in their parks. And so I think these are really very key, um, key courses and key efforts that will be uh, in development. Um, and so the goal is to help managers and superintendents appreciate the importance and relevancy of history to resources management, interpretation, and to their decision making. So for example, uh, one way to de demonstrate that value is to um, you know, tell them how park administrative histories and baseline documentation can help them uh, manage their park better, or to help them realize that historical thinking can help them deal with discussions of difficult and controversial issues, or to prepare for those, um, should they, uh, uh, those controversies should they arise, um, or just having confidence to deal with that controversy forthrightly. Um, so we have been very fortunate to work with a very creative instructional designer, Alana Finney, who has introduced us to the principles of online and adult learning and plunged us into this whole world of audience analysis, module maps, course maps, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a great um, learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, one of the guiding principles that Alana has emphasized over and over is that we need to always connect the course and learning goals to the workplace. Um, we're also designing with the understanding that our learners are busy people, and so we have to teach big ideas in very time-effective ways. But I think perhaps slowly we've come to understand how powerful online learning can be when we use visuals and audio and other media possibilities that will be available to us. And I think I became a believer when I discovered um, a short video on YouTube that explained historiography pretty well in less than four minutes. So I, um, <laughs> I thought maybe there's some possibilities here. So the second, um, the second effort we're making um, is related to uh, the call to action. And, um, and I think this has the potential uh, for service-wide impact. Uh, since 2012, Christine and I have been part of a really wonderful interdisciplinary team charged with helping the Park Service accomplish action number three, history lesson. And this action challenges the Park Service to excite and involve new audiences in the exploration of the full diversity of the American experience by conducting history discovery events, projects, and activities that invite them to explore and share their heritage using a variety of participatory methods 
in at least 100 parks and programs. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of Associate Director Stephanie Toothman and some really wonderful leadership from Chris Abbott, in the, our team leader in the Southeast region. Uh, these history discovery events and activities can take multiple forms. They might include oral history projects that invite people to tell their stories and incorporate them into the narrative of a park. They might be programs that explore and discuss conflicting accounts of the past. Um, they might be events that acknowledge multiple perspectives on the, uh, on the past. And activities that teach visitors to research their own history and connect it to the stories the park tells. We hope that these activities and events encourage us to think critically about the past, draw on its lessons to foster a vibrant civic life, and recognize that we all make history. Um, history lesson reminds us that the practice of history is central to the work of the Park Service and all of its units and all of its programs. I think one of the most important accomplishments of our team is the development of suggested guidelines and best practices to help parks, programs, and partners develop exemplary projects. Uh, we hope to share these guiding documents soon, and I have a, um, a draft of that that I hope we'll be, we'll be able to share very quickly. And you will, uh, to my mind, uh, the, these guiding principles that, and best practices that we've put together, what we're calling some signposts, um, is one of the best uh, summaries of imperial promise, all in about seven and a half, six and a half pages, and it's also offering a strategy uh, for uh, encouraging and create, encouraging change. So uh, let me just share some of these uh, signposts and some of the uh, series of questions that um, uh, that we ask people to consider as they are developing some of these uh, history discovery events. Uh, for the signpost that we call history as process, we ask them to consider, does the event acknowledge that history is an ongoing conversation about the past and its meanings, not something that's done and over in one moment of time? Does it consider the evolution of interpretations? Does it model, use, and encourage the processes of historical thinking? Does it recognize the Park Service's role as an actor in many narratives? Does the event highlight the open-endedness of the past and how people have shaped events? The signpost we call history as collaborative asks, does the event include multiple perspectives? Do you reach out to other disciplines and other experts? Does the event recognize that not all expertise resides in the agency or the academy, but also in the audience? Does the event provide a forum for other voices and allow new audiences to speak rather than having us tell their untold stories. For history of civic engagement, a signpost that reminds us that history may be used to develop a respect for differences, empathetic listening, and deeper reflection about the relationship between past and present. Does the event provide a time and place for reflection on and exploration of difference? Does it forthrightly address conflict and con controversy both in and about the past? Does the event build relationships and encourage long-term engagement with the Park Service, Park Resources, and programs? And finally, what we call history is human ecology, a signpost that calls for an awareness of the world outside of our fences. Does the event emphasize connections of parks with the larger histories beyond their boundaries? Does the event serve as a model that can be adapted and applied in other NPS units and programs? Does it highlight the effects of human activity on natural areas? Does the event use tools that the digital humanities revolution is bringing to the practice of history to share Park Service resources with new audiences? And I think that you can see that in a very um, economical way, we have really um, echoed many of the concerns and that these are a really um, challenging set of questions but I think the way that we will be sharing them will be very encouraging to people, and we are offering um, kind of help along their journey. Um, in the end, I think Imperial Promise reminds us that history matters, and it encourages us to, cl to claim the passion that we have for history. Passion doesn't cost anything, and its, va its value is priceless. Toward the end of the report, the authors quote from a speech uh, that Ruth Abram of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum 
and founder of the International Coalition of the Sites of Conscience, delivered at a Park Service sponsored event in 2004. And they found this um, summary of the speech on the um, Northeast Regional website. She said, we hold the power of history in our hands, the power to offer role models, the power to illuminate directions and strategies, the power to provide safe places for civic dialogue, the power to play a central role in the ongoing task of democracy building. And it's a power that I don't think we should squander. Thank you. Thanks so much, Luann. Um, I'm here to introduce our next two speakers. And I want to say to everyone that we're, we have plenty of time for discussion this afternoon, so we're priming the pump with three quick presentations. And at the end of the afternoon, we'll also have Q&A with all of the authors. Um, please also feel free to use our Twitter hashtag to post questions along the way. I see lots of activity there already, and I thank those of you who are following us um, in the room or uh, beyond on the live stream. So we thought that one way to continue to prime the discussion would be to look at some terrific park, uh, work that's being done at one of our parks. We could have picked any number of, of National Park Service sites. The one that we decided to look at uh, for a while here today is Valley Forge National Historical Park. And I know we have a number of people here from Valley Forge, so I wonder if you would raise your hands and uh, allow us to thank you for your great work. Thank you, there's the Valley Forge group right up in the front. So for our next two speakers, um, I will introduce uh, both of them. Uh, we have with us Barbara Pollerine, who's the Chief of Interpretation for the National Park Service Northeast Region, um, who's had a long and distinguished career in the NPS, starting at Independence National Historical Park, I believe as a student, right, Barb? Um, and she would uh, share the Chancellor's story about the bicentennial. You may have bumped into him on his tours through the neighborhood. Um, and among her posts, and the reason that she's uh, going to speak to us next, is that she was previously the Deputy Superintendent of Valley Forge National Historical Park. And following Barb will be uh, Wayne Bodel, who is a historian at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He specializes in the colonial era through the early republic. He earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we've invited him here today uh, primarily because he is the author of The Valley Forge Winter, Civilians and Soldiers at War. Um, and Wayne and I think met when we were both on a scholar's visit at Valley Forge um, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, some time ago. Um, so the three of us have been getting into trouble together for a while. Um, so I welcome Barb Pollerine to the stage. Good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot, Charlene. And it is true. We've been hanging around together for quite a long time. Um, my job here today is to really talk about how some of the things that have just been presented to you might actually be put into play in a park in the real world, uh, trying to work with the public on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I have to say that uh, this whole process for us began long before Imperiled Promise. But the reason that it began for us, and there's uh, the chief of planning of, of Valley Forge still in the in the audience here today is that we were doing a master plan uh, for the park, something that we used to do about every 25 years. So you can imagine the amount of research, the amount of surveying, the amount of data that was being collected to do this master planning effort. And when we got started with all of this master planning, we started to look at how the park was viewed in the 1980s when the first master plan was done. And what we found was that about one paragraph dealt with the natural resources of the park. Recreation, which had been part of the, the activity in the park since the 19th century, was going to be relegated to an outpost across a river that there was no bridge to cross. Um, and, and that um, the public, especially the local and regional public, was really interested in this place. And that they really hadn't had an opportunity to engage with us bureaucrats much on what this place meant and what we should be doing. So um, just as a little context, because all of you who are historians need a little context, um, Valley Forge National Historical Park uh, is about a five square mile area, 20 miles away from downtown Philadelphia. And 
it's the largest open space within about 50 miles of the city. You can imagine how the importance of that has changed since when George Washington actually came back as a tourist during the Constitutional Convention to rest and relax um, and fish, and then remarked to some folks, and also in his own writings, how glad he was to see that the place had changed and that not much of what he and his army had had there just 10 years before was no longer there and that the citizens were using this place once again. So what we learned in gathering information is that we had about a million and a half visitors every year. But we also had almost a million people visiting our website. And what were we doing with that? We would have master planning meetings. They're required by law. And usually, there's someone standing in the front and a bunch of uh, eight or 10 of the public and then a big row of Park Service people in the background. Um, not a very conversational, let's get with you and hear what you have to say kind of an atmosphere. So we tried some different things with doing public meetings. Um, one was that we would know we would not do a talking head like I'm being today, uh, but that we would do something similar to this, which is have some presentations and then set it up like a workshop. And then we, the people who are working in the park, would do what some of you are going to do in the audience today, is we would staff a table, have a topic, and start the conversation. I learned more in those workshop settings than I've probably learned in the past 20 years about how the public wants to enjoy and appreciate history, how they want to, even though they may be running in the park or walking their dog, it doesn't mean that they're oblivious to the importance of the place where they are, and that they often select that place to walk or run or fly a kite with their family because they do honor and believe that it's important to preserve these places. And I had them say to me, they would come in with their nice little GMP newsletter that we're required to put out. Uh, I have to read that for homework. They didn't have to. And they would come with it all marked up and say, well, I thought about this, and I thought about that. And I was so impressed with how interested they were in everything from whether or not we were preserving the buildings to whether or not teachers were going to have access to the research that we were doing. So it was, a, it was a real education. And when I read the Imperiled Promise and saw some of the recommendations about how we really need to engage the public, by accident we did that. But I have to be a person who's a testifier to the fact that it really changed our thinking about the place, about what it meant, and what we should be doing there. So what did we do after we, we gathered all of this information? We worked with historians like Charlene, um, who opened my eyes to the beauty and meaning of monuments, uh, which most of us in the park weren't really interested in, but after spending a few hours with her, I never looked at them the same. And the same with Wayne's work, um, and, and there, were, there was a team of historians originally at Valley Forge, and I think they had a fundamental effect on helping us move from a naked soldier in a blanket uh, in a snowstorm at Valley Forge to discovering that really the importance of the place was all about how it became an army at Valley Forge. So without their help, we wouldn't have thought about it in that way as well. So in working with historians, in working with the public, and then looking at the data, what did we do with that? How did we try to continue engaging the public? But also, what did we have to change about how we operated? So since I'm a, a gears meshing kind of a person, I've always been an operations person, and I was often on the chief interpreter at Valley Forge while doing other jobs, I focused a lot on the events and the programming and the educational offerings that we would, we would try uh, to provide. And I think in our time, we always have to work with partners because we don't really know everything. They are also representative of the communities because they are there whether I transfer or one of the rangers transfers or whether the superintendent transfers. They're the folks who are there all the time. And just like all of you, the public are the owners of the national parks, and we have a responsibility to engage them as often as we can. So we decided we needed to offer choices, choices that would meet lots of people's needs. We're usually open with the buildings 9 to 5. When are a lot of the people at Valley Forge between 6 and 9 in the morning, and then in the summer from 4 to 9 at, at night? Well, we're, 
What are they going to do? How are they going to get any information? So we tried some things. I'm not saying all things were completely successful or that we would do them all again, but it doesn't hurt to try a few things. So we did things like tried cell phone technology and so that you could be there 24-7. And if you were interested and you came from a business meeting at the office park and you were taking a walk and you wanted to learn something, you could do it. Um, we tried to enhance our presence on the web. We even chose, over time, uh, to make certain that one of the park ranger positions was dedicated almost exclusively to media. Where are we going to get to people that don't talk to us or aren't there at the times when we're open? So we tried to dedicate some actual staff time to that. We had ongoing work with historians. Um, at the time, Charlene was at Villanova. And off and on, we had students doing research on other aspects of the stories of the park and engage them in the ongoing story development. We also started to work with teachers. The Park Service is famous for designing everything for educators without ever talking to them. Um, we're really good at that because we know, we always know. Um, and so instead, uh, through one of my colleagues who's in the audience, I met a master teacher from a local school district. And then we, we have a program called Teacher Ranger Teacher in the National Park Service. For those of you who are educators, you can spend a summer in a park under this program helping us to understand what teachers really need. We had some Teacher Ranger teachers in, and they helped us rethink some of the programming. And as a matter of fact, one of the programs that a master teacher helped us with um, became the most popular and the most reserved formal education program that we did. So we didn't think it up ourselves, we worked with others. We also started to collaborate with local users. Um, there are a lot of running clubs, walking clubs, um, skiing clubs that use Valley Forge as a training location. It's sort of a central hub, lots of people can get there quickly, and we sort of knew they existed, but we never talked to them. Uh, so we started to talk to them, and we had a meeting about trails, and what we decided to do is to advertise the meeting about trails, not with a news release, but with signage all around the bathrooms, which are all over the park. And we ended up, without doing the traditional media stuff, with standing room only meetings, public meetings about trails, and how we could have recreational facilities that would not overshadow the history, but coexist with it. And what I learned from all of those folks um, is that they too choose that place for a reason. They can run at a track, they can run through their neighborhood, but they often come to Valley Forge and run because it represents things like triumph over adversity. People who walk there are coming back from heart attacks. One gentleman who started doing that ended up being a 15 year volunteer in the park. Um, so you can, never, you can never put a label on somebody, that's another thing I learned about just because I saw them walking and running that they weren't interested in some of the other things that we were doing. And one of the last things we started to do is we do, the Park Service is very well known for doing living history, for having the kinds of events that you may have attended with your families, where we have costumed interpreters, we may have reenactors. We did a lot of that kind of programming because it's the kind of program that, that focuses on the history and also on important dates in, this, in the story of the park. But we started to hear, and I started to read in the sign-in book in the visitor center, that a lot of visitors thought that maybe Veterans Day might be a day when programming could happen at Valley Forge. And maybe Memorial Day could be a day when we would have programming at the park. And the 4th of July, because most people don't remember December 19th, 1777. Um, they don't know that that's the important date where they should, should be at Valley Forge. Um, they know that this place represents triumph over adversity, some of the democratic ideals that we all grew up with in school. And also, since we're the birthplace of the Army, why aren't we honoring veterans, whether they be veterans from previous struggles or ones that we're currently facing? So we started to try to do some events that acknowledge the commemorative, the ongoing commemorative relationship with the place. Those are some of the things that we did, and some that are still going on, and I know this Veterans Day, because I just read all about it, is the biggest one ever, with all kinds of partners, and, um, and you can't go to one of those without walking away, being moved in some way. Um, so I'd invite you to go out on November 11th to Valley Forge. But we also found out that 
the response to us being open to the conversation, to our owners, the public, had a lot of other benefits. They support us and advocate for us. When there's a funding issue, when there's um, a controversy like managing deer, um, and, and it goes out over social media that, you know, we are just making these choices based on no science and just because that's what bureaucrats do. What happened on social media? They, when, we, when it first went out, when everybody was all scared, oh, don't put it on the social media, the people engaged in, so, in, in social media who knew the facts started telling the other people who were waving their arms and telling stories, oh, no, 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 you need to go to the park's website and look at the fact sheet that's up on the web. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand that. That's not why they're doing that. We didn't even have to do that. They came together for us on doing that. And then I would say that our friends organization, which was about 50 people when I first started working at the park in 2001, the more we opened up, the more they came to that organization to support us financially as volunteers and advocates. And now the number is about 17 or 1,800 people. That's a lot of people helping to support a local park. And I would say, besides those kinds of things, funding, support, volunteers, I would say that for me professionally and personally, it was the most humbling and grounding 10 years of my life. And um, I can't say that other people who engaged in this way don't have some of that same feeling about the parks that they live around or that they use each and every day. So I'd encourage all of you, whether you're historians, budding historians, educators, um, volunteers, you're the owners and we need you. And that's what I learned from opening ourselves up to the public and practicing some of the things that are recommended in Imperiled Promise. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. Well, I met Barbara uh, more than 30 years ago when we both worked at um, Valley Forge on, uh, in um, different capacities. And Charlene, it was 11 years ago that we went and told them um, what to do on that um, OAH <laughs> consultant thing, not 15. So um, NPS 101, um, that would have been very um, useful to me. I was sort of homeschooled um, in public history, um, whereas a friend of mine um, writes on her blog, uh, sometimes raised by wolves. Um, and so I guess I'm going to um, tell some um, uh, sort of old war stories about um, working at Valley Forge um, in the early days. Um, I may be uh, either one of the worst candidates that could have been found to discuss the topic of the practice of history um, in the national parks, or perhaps a peculiarly appropriate choice for that function. Um, the reasons in both cases would be essentially the same, idiosyncrasy, happenstance, and the rule of unintended consequences. Uh, with her kind invitation, Charlene Myers suggested the following po as a possible framework for my remarks. How I ended up studying Valley Forge, the historiography that framed my project, and trends today that may offer uh, challenges or opportunities to the parks. So I'll try to follow that um, framework. I'm something of an accidental scholar of early America, and I was a completely accidental public historian. I went to uh, graduate school to study the political and social history of the progressive era. Um, department authorities warned my cohort early on about the looming job crisis in um, academia. Many of my contemporaries left the field very quickly. The rest of us were apparently too clueless to comprehend the circumstances or maybe to know what to do about it. Um, I finished coursework, passed my comprehensive exams, poked away for a few years at uh, several variations of a dissertation project that was very 20th century. Um, although I'll say in retrospect that it had some dimensions that were probably more public in implication than historiographical. A phone call out of the blue from a generous thesis advisor about a possible three-month job at Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area relayed to him by a former student who had found refuge um, from that job crisis in the Park Service. Writing National Register of Historic Places nominations led to an informal preliminary interview uh, at which I was offered a job that I hadn't applied for. Um, I had never heard of the National Register um, or the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. I didn't know what a SHPO was, um, and if you don't, it's State Historic Preservation Officer. 
uh, much less than that since the park uh, in question sprawled into two different states, I would be working with two schpos. Um, a cousin of mine lived about six miles upriver from the park, um, and I'd even fished in it once, but I didn't know what it was or where it was. Um, the park staff could give little or no supervision to the work, and the regional office cultural resources shop was 100 miles away. Um, the project stemmed from a federal court order in a case that the Interior Department lost, um, and the superintendent was not wildly enthusiastic about the work. I would spend the winter in a cabin in a decommissioned honeymoon resort in the Poconos. Um, it sounded, in other words, a little, uh, more than a little like some aspects of academia, um, an, unf an unfamiliar topic. Um, self-supervision, a honeymoon cabin in the Poconos, um, and a green pickup truck with a brown arrowhead on the door. Um, and I quickly came to love uh, some elements of it. I also learned that a paycheck was a sure stimulus to my work habits and a casual prod from a dissertation committee. Um, I stumbled onto the fact that a little hustle might be rewarded. The superintendent was not crazy about my project, but a pot of coffee that I confessed to having made um, reminded him of his days in the Navy, um, and a few volunteer hours on a project that he did care about earned me um, a sentence in a memorandum that he wrote on a different subject to the regional director, urging that I be kept on the payroll. Um, I can't say anything more here about the tale of the two Spos, um, except that each of the 40 National Register nominations that I wrote has its own Wikipedia page today. Um, well, I don't, and don't ever expect to have any such thing. Um, okay, so I Google myself once in a while. Um, who doesn't? Um, the superintendent's memo led to an offer from the regional historian to join the impending Valley Forge project team. Three kind secretaries in the regional office ganged up on their bosses and on me that summer to keep me from playing or blundering my way off that team. While the Civil Service Commission, does anybody know what the Civil Service Commission used to be? Um, ground away at the paperwork. Uh, more on the project itself in due time, but it had as many accidents, some but not all of them actually happy ones, um, and circumstantial coincidences as the National Register work that had led to it. Um, the historiography that uh, framed my project, there was none. Um, at least that's what I had the nerve to claim in the introductory chapter that I had to write uh, several years later to turn the Valley Forge report into an academic dissertation. This was doubtless at best an, an exaggeration and less than fair to the authors of some perfectly worthy, if basically unreflected, books about the American Revolution in 1777 and 1778. Uh, nevertheless, it was a defendable assertion. The new social history of the 1960s and early 1970s had paved the way uh, by 1976 to a wide range of other new histories, um, including a new military history uh, best represented then by the work of John Shy at the University of Michigan um, and by Seth Brueggemann's predecessor um, colleague at Temple, um, Russell Wigley, which aimed to move beyond the battlefield and to look at military life uh, and its context from the bottom up. As many a ranger interpreter in her time has pointed out, um, possibly Barbara, um, there was no battle at Valley Forge. Um, not until we began recovering the repeated political, economic, and cultural struggles over a century to preserve the site, first as a state park and then to transfer it into federal custody, um, or until we began to create more situations of the same kind during our research. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the Golden Fleece Award nomination from the editors of a mainline newspaper that we were given, um, or the angry resolution from the Virginia Daughters of the American Revolution, um, or especially the penciled, block-lettered, one-page note from a taxpayer in Sheboygan um, criticizing our still unreported research conclusions and ending with the ominous phrase, the people don't like it. Um, I personally date the um, beginning of the Tea Party Revolution from that note. Um, where the snarky headline in the Philadelphia Inquirer over Clark DeLeon's humor column summarizing an interview that I did about George Washington with the words, I cannot tell a lie, it's all baloney. Charlene, is that a legend, the Yankee? Uh, my second superintendent, here I can name names, um, Gil Lusk, who's a history major at Gettysburg College and a Park Service up-and-comer, um, despite the fact that his career track had led through eastern parks with a lot of old buildings in them. Um, none of them made out of Pueblo mud or carved into the sides of Mesozoic-era sandstone cliffs. Um, Gil handled that kind of cultural static with more aplomb than we ABD history geek slackers ever could have thought of. 
um, and despite uh, the staggering time demands uh, at integrating a new park staff during its uh, bicentennial year, um, he gave us enough space and protection to let us proceed with our work. Um, but I'm talking about historiography, so just to complete that point, uh, the broad field redefining work of Shai, Wigley, and others was just beginning to pay off by the late 1970s in narrower academic projects, uh, the reconstructed events, episodes, institutions, and practices that clarified the context of the Valley Forge winter um, and showed what it may have meant. Those works were published slightly too late to shape or be reflected in our report. Jack Rakoff's book on the Continental Congress in 1979, Wayne Karp's volume on revolutionary logistics to serve the army at pleasure in 1980. Uh, there was also a surge of productivity in what uh, some uh, are now known as um, founders' papers projects in that time, um, which would have been very helpful um, to us if they had um, come out. Uh, we had been watching and hoping um, that the George Washington papers would catch up to the Valley Forge year although it quickly became apparent that it would not do so in time for us. The 1930s version that we used uh, fell well short of contemporary standards for editorial work and annotation, and it did not uh, include incoming documents, uh, which in many cases were uh, more important than Washington's own letters. This circumstance threw us back on a seemingly dying technology, a microfilm, um, one that has still not actually died. Uh, back to the project. Um, all of this, of course, was fantastically expensive. We were shielded from most of the actual uh, budget realities. But compared to this infamous shutdown year, um, they were shocking in a good way. Um, five researchers traveled for a year, about 25% of the time. Um, a computer card called a government transportation request presented at an airport counter with a federal ID um, would get you on a plane that day um, to anywhere you said you needed to go. Um, without even taking your shoes off or emptying your pockets. Um, these were also accepted by most hotels. Um, laptop computers um, definitely did not exist then, and we were certainly not being sent on these trips um, to sit there um, writing um, notes on three by five cards. So we simply identified manuscripts of likely interest to the project, filled out the forms, and asked the archivist to send the copies to us at Valley Forge. Um, Xerox the third floor was a kind of inside joke um, on the project at that point. Um, all of these methodological and procedural realities specific to time, place, and circumstance had important outcome level consequences. Um, to not follow that old graduate school dictum to immerse yourself in the secondary literature before beginning archival research, um, to have multiple historical imaginations or consciousnesses out there harvesting, sources um, in three different directions from Valley Forge, um, to carry out at best minimal processing or digesting of the growing archive of documents before heading out to seek more goodies, um, to have no substantially refined argument to offer until you literally begin to research um, in the project files after the, the road search has uh, been completed. Um, none of these things would have been comprehended, much less thought advisable or even tolerated um, at any of the graduate institutions where any of us were trained in the academic practice of history. Uh, I'm going to argue, however, um, that this somewhat half-baked and totally circumstantially determined approach to the project caused as much and hopefully more good than it did harm. Um, as certified um, post-Watergate uh, anarchists, we were primed from the first days to conclude that the winter at Valley Forge brought neither the darkest hour of the revolution nor provided its turning point. Um, Post-Watergate was actually a term used in an internal critique of the work. Um, I added anarchists just for the fun of it. Um, as graduate students steeped in or at least exposed to the new social history, we planned from the start. Uh, we planned to start from the bottom up and from the outside in to set privates on a level with general officers, to describe civilians as being important to the Valley Forge story as soldiers. Um, even our somewhat cautious bosses in the regional office had no major problems with these perspectives, and the superintendent was eager to embrace them. Uh, the primary operational goal of the project was to recover what the National Park Service called the physical history of the park site itself, uh, what we might now call its material culture history so that they would not make any embarrassing resource-destroying development decisions. Um, and it was only secondarily uh, there for the purpose of interpretive enhancement. 
Within those parameters, we had temporarily at least great tactical leeway. Uh, we could do whatever we want, as a matter of fact. Uh, the project was interdisciplinary, including archaeological and architectural history um, specialists. Working with a team of interpretive planners from the Park Service's Denver Service Center, who were delighted to contemplate episodes of conflict, scandal, or perversity, uh, they often wanted more of this than we could find. Um, we established cordial and productive relationships with the people who had the capacity to connect the past uh, with people who dwell in the present, uh, more of it than, an, than any of us did, certainly. For about a year, they flew into Philadelphia for meetings with the researchers, as they called us, um, every few months, and two of us um, on one occasion flew out to Denver. Um, we got to see some of our more conceptual sensibilities about what we had found gain traction in their imaginations, um, and then to see what only those imaginations could do um, with that stuff on the ground. Uh, despite some traditionalist pushback, more from their bosses, I think, than ours, um, we got a sense that we had at least slightly moved the ball um, on the subject of Valley Forge. Um, but what about the written reports that would soon be the only enduring evidence that there had ever been a research project? Um, here, I think the plus-minus trade-off between working uh, to some historiographical template and not doing so became more complicated and more problematical um, than it did in interacting with members of other disciplines. Uh, in the latter case, not doing so uh, made it necessary for us to be more tangible um, in the metaphors of conceptual description that we used. Uh, we simply had to use figures of speech that would not be likely to be heard, say, at an American Historical Association meeting. Um, or else risk not being um, comprehended at all. Um, sitting alone facing the tyranny of the blank page, um, on the other hand, um, ordinary language became just plain scary. Um, what am I going to write? Um, I should be more forthcoming here about what I mean when I say we. My colleague on this project, Jacqueline Thibault, um, should not go unmentioned. Um, we divided the report into um, three distinct volumes, and Jackie took the second and third while I took the first. Um, once we stopped traveling, three people, um, including a secretary, looked kind of dumb, sitting around in a dark basement office sharing one typewriter. Um, so the powers that be on the project decided that we could work from home long before telecommute um, entered the lexicon. Um, this decision was good for us and the Philadelphia Electric Company. It was bad for SEPTA and the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission. And it was a godsend of a private center um, for a company then called Ma Bell. Um, time is short, so I won't elaborate, but the blank page and the thin historiography forced us, um, or me at least, to be more tangible and creative when imagining a narrative structure for a report that would be at once more sophisticated, complex, and perverse than bloody footprints in the snow, but that had to be less abstract than, say, artisan republicanism um, or the legendary white whale of the transition to capitalism. Um, it was just necessary to set all that kind of stuff aside and, and talk a little bit more plainly. For me, this could only be done um, because of the providential availability of complete copies of the archival documents. Um, thankfully, we had full text photocopies of centuries old records, um, not the skeletal notes that we might have taken with laptops. Now I had an excuse to consider my unvacuumed living room floor strewn with letters, diaries, and order books as a contribution to knowledge. Um, to, take, to treat takeout cheesesteaks from the shop up the street as a sacrifice um, for the benefit of the future, um, to view dense reconstruction from the text as perhaps my gift to theory and practice. Uh, but I run out of time and I try patience, so I think um, uh, in recovering the, uh, what I call the project itself from deep memory, um, we can explore any of this stuff that may seem um, worth it. Um, in the smaller discussion sessions that we'll soon have. Um, it might be better to conclude here by addressing Charlene's third suggested framing device, trends today that may offer opportunities or challenges to the parks. Um, and here I'm going to stick with Valley Forge in its broadest Delaware Valley context. Um, one, loyalism. Uh, scholars have been forever trying to take this phenomenon and its practitioners seriously, um, and we're very close to figuring out how to do it. Um, careful thinkers about historical research methods have set the table with tools. For Pennsylvania, we even have a recent exemplar, David Maxey's um, Treason on Trial, the case of John Roberts Miller, published uh, by the American Philosophical Society, 
lights the way toward integrating the personnel of this phenomenon, loyalism, um, its personality, um, and the moral and political dilemmas it posed for contemporaries. Um, and even offers an accessible language of analysis. Uh, Maxie is a, a semi-retired um, litigator um, from a big law firm, um, and he knows how to um, take evidence and turn it into um, persuasive um, prose. Radicalism. Um, even liberals who became progressives are now using the L word again. Um, the revolution in Pennsylvania was truly revolutionary. Um, the plain truth of that survived even the collapse of the old progressive historiographical synthesis um, and at least needed to be resuscitated by the neo-progressive turn of the 1960s. The Delaware Valley's array of preserved and interpreted revolutionary sites is the best place to acknowledge that fact. And again, we have exemplars at hand in abundance. Um, I just came back the other day from a graduate student conference in Illinois um, dedicated to the memory of the late Alfred F. Young um, and his oeuvre, his work, um, is that exemplar. Um, if Alfred Young could make radicalism work in stodgy old Massachusetts, Pennsylvania should be the proving ground that the revolution was radical. This should be a collaborative multi-site enterprise. At Washington Crossing on December 27th, 28th, and 29th, 1776, um, George Washington, the Virginian, finally learned how to talk to Yankees. This is not the crossing of the Delaware. This is persuading soldiers who um, have every right to um, pack and go home in a couple of days to actually stay a little longer um, and follow up on the momentum that they've created. Uh, the Brandywine Battlefield neighborhood seethed with spies, guides, and opportunists. The streets uh, of Philadelphia around Fort Wilson at 3rd and Walnut Street, right outside of my old uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Office, um, refute any notions about the existential difference between the French and the American revolutions. Um, the Park Service with the new Revolutionary War Museum um, that's being created can make this story uh, both comprehensible and digestible to visitors. Geography and the environment. Um, the story of the radical revolution in a state that was reluctant in 1776 to even sign the Declaration of Independence um, is fundamentally a story of environment and cultural geography. The New England soldiers whose voices we recovered in our research and who became to too great an extent the voice of the Continental Army um, gaped wide-eyed as they made their way after defeating um, General Burgoyne um, up in New York. Um, they gaped as they made their way um, uh, out of the Taconic and Berkshire Hills of their youths, down the widening Hudson Valley, um, across the Garden State of New Jersey, and into what they saw as a biblical land of Goshen in Pennsylvania. Um, seeing barns bigger than their houses, um, corn cribs nicer than their childhood sleeping lofts, flat, endless farms bigger than their grandparents had ever owned, um, and the signs of a fat harvest could not believe that the short rations they received in Pennsylvania were the result of anything except Quaker perfidy. James Lemon's classic uh, 1972 text, The Best Poor Man's Country, may seem to ears retuned to the cultural, and his, uh, cultural history turn, um, a bit dry and lifeless, but it offers a foundation and a base map for understanding these perceptions. Lucy Simler's and Paul Clemens's studies in Chester County of labor systems are more nuanced and personalized. Um, Clemens has continued his work across the Delaware River in South Jersey. Combined with the economic reconstruction of the region being produced by the program on early American economy and society at the Library Company of Philadelphia, um, the emerging experiments of scholars like Billy G. Smith, um, who are using GPS technology um, to reconstruct late 18th century Philadelphia, the raw materials are at hand for a remarkable uh, integration of the proverbial playing field on which the events of 1776 uh, to 1780 took place. Productive partnerships between the Park Service and enterprises like the Urban Archives at Temple, um, the McNeil Center at Penn, and this new Museum of the American Revolution could quickly make this vision a reality. Um, and last but not last, um, race, uh, class, and gender. I think we've already talked a little bit about class. Um, the story, the reconstruction of the story, the experience of African Americans in, um, in Pennsylvania during the late 18th century has been extended. Um, turn after they surrendered political power and became moral reformers again. Um, the uh, revival of racism 
particularly in Philadelphia, um, paradoxically as slavery is being gradually um, uh, taken apart. Um, Charlene's um, uh, work on, on the neighborhood around um, Independence Hall, uh, uh, the, the, the proximity between the, and the emergence of an African-American neighborhood. Um, that's all been done. Um, on women, that there is, there's more than enough stuff to, to, to make a, um, a strong synthesis between these kind of academic currents and, and, um, and storytelling. Uh, and I'll just close by saying uh, we learned at Valley Forge um, the people who come to American National Parks don't shy away from controversy. Um, and they love scandal, um, as all humans do. Um, but they want stories. Um, they don't want syntheses. They don't want hypotheses and things of that sort. And I think the Park Service is, is best in a position um, to, um, to, to make that work. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Barb. Um, I want to mention that there are some notable people following us on Twitter and on the live stream. Um, among them, um, Sue Ferentinos, who organized the early scholars visit be that we did at Valley Forge, um, is tweeting away and uh, marveling that it's been 11 years and is glad to have seen some product unfolded. Um, also, there are at least two authors of the Imperiled Promise Report who are, who are watching the live stream. And, and tweeting today, and so I want to give a shout out to Ann Wisnant and to Marla Miller uh, for participating with us virtually. So we're now going to take a 10 minute break in the room, um, so we'll reconvene at 3 o'clock. And for those, of those who are on the live stream, I want to mention that when we come back, we'll be uh, forming discussion groups within the room. So you're not going to see anything happening in the podium. Um, you will be able to follow, follow on Twitter on the hashtag HistoryNPS. Um, and please do rejoin us on the live stream around 345 when we have closing remarks by Seth Brueggemann from Temple University. Uh, thank you, everyone. So let's continue the conversation over some food, which is in the back.
So I'm sorry I have to interrupt all these great conversations. I'm really just interrupting so we can start you on additional great conversations. Um, so if you could have a seat and we'll have the discussion facilitators come up to the front just for some brief introductions uh, before we start uh, table discussions. So at this point, I'm turning the program over to my friend Christine Arado, who's going to organize us for some continuing conversation about issues raised by the Imperiled Promise Report. So now for something totally different. Um, I want to just start with one thought and then move quickly into discussion. More than 100 years ago, an advocate of the parks for national parks had referred to the idea of a park as a place for the refinement of the republic, a place to uh, engage civically or to practice being community. And I think some of the threads from the earlier conversations, our presentations, were really about how do we create a community of practice um, around history and historical thinking. And so this is really our task today collectively is to you know, practice creating community, creating that community of practice thinking historically. So I just wanted to run through very quickly how we hope this will work as an experiment. Uh, each one of the panelists, we have t uh, four sets of panelists, or three sets of panelists and me, um, are going to introduce themselves very quickly, just to give you a sense of who they are and the, the big idea uh, that's going to be at their table. Uh, then we're going to break into four groups. You can vote with your feet. They'll go to their table and um, there'll be a, a vibrant discussion. Uh, you'll get to introduce yourselves and a really parley about this particular idea based on your experience or your thoughts, your reflections on the panelists, wherever you want to take it. This is a community of practice. It's not dictated by an expert. And after 25 minutes, um, we'll reconvene. Uh, all of this will be tweeted uh, into you know, the tweetosphere. Uh, and <laughs> And then Seth is going to lead us in thinking in a conclusion about reflecting about our experience. So this is an experiment. Um, be innovative, be willing to take chances, uh, and if we fall flat on our face, um, we at least tried something new and innovative. So I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Patricia West, and she'll sort of lead the way, and you'll see like a kind of like a beauty contest stream of candidates coming up, trying to entice you to join them at the table. I had prepared an exquisite little speech that was going to be like three, four minutes, but Christine said this is like speed dating, um, which I've never done. So if I do it wrong, you know, we'll just have to, we'll just have to live through it. Um, I guess I, I could start with the fact that I'm the museum curator at Martin Van Buren National Historic Site in Kinderhook, New York, and I teach in the public history graduate program at the University at Albany. Um, I guess I'm best known for a book I wrote a while back called Domesticating History, which is a book about um, the history of the Historic House Museum. And as a way of leading into the topic of um, our panel, the reason that I wrote that book, or one of the primary reasons, was I had been spending, I had spent maybe the first 20 years or so of my career trying to do what we used to call untold stories, that is integrating um, uh, voices we didn't normally hear into house museum tours, primarily uh, the history of d domestic service. And I became interested in an ac as an academic in why was that so difficult and as a historian I looked to the history of the institution I was trying to work with for the answers and I hope that, um, th well it did help me to understand why it was so difficult and I hope it has helped the hundreds of unfortunate graduate students who have been forced to read this by people like Seth Brueggemann to understand why that kind of, um, that the history of the institution itself um, was, was presenting an obstacle to the kind of interpretation that I wanted to do. Okay, I guess that's probably it for speed dating, huh? You want to nod? Okay, all right, so that's, those are the kinds of things we'll, we'll probably be talking about. We'll be talking about um, uh, constructivist history and what uh, Seth Brueggemann tells us we should be doing more of, which is a reflexive history, the history of our institutions and understanding how the history of those institutions, particularly the National Park Service, put certain kinds of pressure on the way um, the stories that we can tell. I'm Joan, I'm Joan Zenzen. I'm an independent historian uh, based in the D.C. area, and I 
love the national parks and have managed to find a career in writing about them for the past 20 some years. Uh, and what I focused on is um, something that we've talked about earlier is administrative histories. I write histories not of the park story, but of how a park was established and how it's been managed over time. And I write these histories as a way to uh, help the park superintendent and managers to figure out where they've been and where they want to go in their planning. But I also hope that these histories reach a broader audience to um, uh, policymakers, and you, know, you can wish for Congress people to read them, but also for the general public to have an appreciation of what effort it went into to set these special places aside and what all of us need to do to make sure that those places remain special and remain um, well taken care of over time. I'm Deirdre Gibson. I'm Chief of Planning and Resource Management at Valley Forge, and I am not a historian. I think I'm the only one in the... <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a planner who uses history in a lot of the um, work that we do, the resource management and planning that we do. Um, Valley Forge is one of those big stories that's part of the creation myth of the United States, and um, even a lot of our visitors, about 80% of our visitors don't come there for the history, but they tell us, like Barb said, um, yeah, I, I know something important happened there. I'm not quite sure what it is. And so we realized that we need to reach out to those people and help them to understand what it is that's important. It's, it's something that people want to check off their life list. And um, we did benefit greatly at Valley Forge from the work that Wayne and Jackie did. It was, it was great to hear those stories about how it came about. I'd never heard some of those wonderful boiler room stories. But I can tell you as someone who uses that report constantly how rich and complex it is and, and how fortunate we are to really know what we know be because of the work that they did over so many years. Um, and as well, we've had um, authors like Joseph Ellis and Thomas Fleming write about Valley Forge. And so we, we know a lot. We know a lot. Um, uh, Barb talked about some of the work that she had done. And uh, my colleague, Rhonda Shear, who's the head of interpretation and education now, has continued Barb's work. and added to it. We've broadened and deepened our events to include many more people. Um, Rhonda just served as guest editor um, and grabbed all the staff and wrote an entire issue of Cobblestone Magazine, which is a children's monthly magazine on history. So an entire issue in Valley Forge just came out last month. Um, she has, um, she's working with a writer's institute for writing um, practice for kids, writing about Valley Forge um, stories, both cultural and natural. And um, she's working with Franklin Institute on cultural and natural summer camp. So, um, so that, that work continues. And you would think that a story as fundamental as Valley Forge, the perseverance of, of the Continental Army in, in the face of overwhelming odds, you would think that that would resonate with every generation. Um, it's a great story. We have talented staff. We have all the information. But it doesn't always. And, and I think part of that is, is the way that the Park Service is set up to do interpretation. You know, those quick, quick, quick people are in and out, in and out. They want to spend an hour. Um, and I think part of it is listening to Wayne, I was realizing as we get farther and farther away from his work, we're, we're losing that complexity. So um, one of the things that Joan and I would like to talk about at, at our group, which will be at that table, is how do we present opportunities um, for people to understand the diversity of history, to really engage in it, to participate in it, and to realize that those themes and stories from Valley Forge, and really at all national parks, are, are common to all of us. They just keep repeating themselves through history. Um, how, do we, how do we pull people into that and help them understand that? So that's the question that interests me. So I'm group three, and I, I want to acknowledge some colleagues who couldn't join us because of some family emergencies. Um, Marty Blatt, the historian and cultural resource manager at uh, Boston National Historical Park, had planned to join us but couldn't, as well as um, Bill Bolger uh, in um, uh, preservation programs here, external programs in the regional office also couldn't join us. Um, I mentioned earlier, it's sort of my speed dating thing, I, I have a little bit of confusion about my title. I've been called the chief historian of the region, a regional historian, the regional historian. Um, what I've learned over the, I don't know, six or so months that I've occupied this position, as well as in my career in the Park Service, um, I've worked in field units um, as well as regional offices. I've managed uh, the, the 
um, John F. Kennedy National Historic Site uh, as the Chief of Operations managing interpretive programs. I was the superintendent at uh, Horseshoe uh, Bend Battlefield. I was the Chief Historian of the Southeast Region over park history programs as well as the big preservation programs out in the community. And uh, you know, I've always had historian somehow in my title and I realized you know, it's dawned on me that my job really is as a collaborator. Um, I bring a certain skill set but I realize there are um, thousands of history practitioners not only in the park service but in my community of practice which is much larger. And what I'd like to talk about uh, the, the official topic for my group uh, is, or our group, if you choose to sit with me, I don't want to be alone anymore, uh, is <laughs> listening to engaging uh, with visitors in new ways or audiences. I want to sort of tackle that term of audience, what that means, if that's really a good term. And I also hope that we can deconstruct the notion of expertise, what that means uh, in terms of these collective productions of knowledge, these collaborations. So um, I think I used more than two minutes. And I'll be sitting over there. Good afternoon. Um, I have a little activity. If you can raise your hand if you use a watch as your primary timekeeping device. OK, raise your hand if you use your cell phone as your primary timekeeping device. OK, just curious. <clears throat> um, my name is Michael Lang. I work as a visual information specialist at the Northeast Regional Office. It's probably one of the longest titles. Um, and I think it's one of the coolest jobs because it really is truly multidisciplinary. It changes every day. I work on things from publications to multimedia to social media to park websites. Um, I'm really trying to help you know, bring the national parks out of like the 20th century, 19th century um, into the 21st century. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. But I'm not a um, historian by training. I went to art school. I was trained as an interpreter. Um, and I worked at some pretty big uh, wilderness national parks out west. And so when I came to the Northeast region, all of a sudden I was looking at Revolutionary War topics, um, Civil War, War of 1812, um, wars I hadn't really thought about since I was in high school in my AP US history class. Um, and time and time again, I was found, I was struck by how uh, passionate the park rangers are about those topics, just as passionate as they are um, as the park rangers out west that I was working with. And, um, and I've had my own kind of personal experience working, you know, using technology um, to communicate uh, these historical topics. For example, I got to work at Gettysburg during the 150th anniversary as part of a social media team. And we reached over a million people um, through our social media efforts, more people online than perhaps actually visited on site. Um, we reached people in all 50 states. We reached people in 18 different countries. Um, and I have a couple of quotes I just want to read to you from people from the Facebook wall. Um, one person wrote, you all did an awesome and outstanding job. I'm in North Carolina and felt like I was there. The photography was stunning. And the at this moment and happening now posts were brilliant. I would like to look at, I would look at this all in the evening after work and kept flipping the laptop around to show my husband, you got to see this picture. This is Facebook at its best. Another person wrote, since I don't walk well, I'm enjoying the Facebook and the TV coverage of the reenactment from my living room. Thank you for your contributions. So in our group, group table four over there with Cherie, she's waving her hand. Um, Renee and I are going to be talking about you know, the role of technology, the role, role of innovation um, in uh, reaching new audiences. You know, is there, what, what role does technology play in reaching those audiences, um, the pros and cons? And, um, uh, and I'm, at this point, I'm going to introduce Renee, who I feel like I have to inter um, embarrass her. She's our Freeman Tilden Award winner from last year, which is the top award for interpretation. And she's far too humble. <laughs> Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I am Renee Albertoli, a park ranger and interpretive specialist at Independence National Historical Park. My favorite two words are, what if? Now, I wasn't always a what ifer. I was actually very cautious about changing my interpretation. And in fact, sometimes I was downright hostile towards new technology. So I know some of you out there in the crowd might feel that same way. So we'd like to invite you all, the what ifers, the I'm on the fence, the I don't want to be replaced with an iPad, the whole crowd of you to join us at our table while we talk about these big questions about where will technology fall in the National Park Service. It's here. We need to talk about it. 
And at this point, I think we're ready to begin. Is that right, Christine? Can I invite everyone to begin the conversations? So we have at this table, um, with, the, with the facilitators for the first table, stand up so that we can see who they are. Why don't we do that? And facilitators for our second table, so we know who's going to be there. That'll be Christine. Thank you very much. Over at the third table, we've got Wayne, right? Mm -hmm. And then Michael and I will be at the fourth table. So please, folks, on your feet, vote with your feet. And I think you can even move around if you don't like the table you picked.
I'd like to ask our discussion facilitators to start wrapping up their discussions now. Well, I hate to interrupt such um, lively conversations, but we will have a chance to continue them. Uh, we're going to take some time now in order to draw together some of the ideas and conversation that we've had um, so far this afternoon. And um, then following our closing speaker, we'll have a more chance for, for interaction. So um, hold those thoughts. Um, it's, it's my great pleasure now to introduce for some closing remarks uh, my friend and colleague Seth Brueggemann, who is a historian at Temple University, where he is director of the Center for Public History. Um, his most recent work is the edited volume, Born in the USA, Birth and Communication in American Public Memory, which we just read in my public history class, so thank you, Seth. Um, he's also the author of Here George Washington Was Born, Memory, Material, Culture, and the Public History of a National Monument. Um, Seth has his PhD in American Studies from the College of William and Mary. Um, he has the, the um, maybe unenviable task of, of um, summing up things for us today. He's been following the Twitter reports from our group discussions. Um, but his, the topic we've asked him to, to address as a, to close our thoughts is um, history as a pillar of civic life. So please welcome Seth Brueggemann. Thank you so much, Charlene. Um, boy, I hate to become so formal uh, in the midst of such a fun, informal conversation, but that's my job. Um, in fact, I've been given two jobs today. Um, the first is to summarize what we've been talking about, uh, which is, uh, it's making me a bit dizzy. I've been following the Twitter feed as you all are talking, and I, I maybe got through five of them um, out of uh, who knows how many. Um, so anyway, but I, I, I'll try to do that. My second job is to, to inspire all of you with a call to action. <laughs> and I, I think you're already pretty well inspired, quite frankly. So I don't know um, that I can do much better at what we've already achieved, but I'll give it a shot and, um, and see where we go. Um, first, let me say by way of uh, some introduction that I, um, I uh, do the things that, that Charlene mentioned. So I run a public history program. I write. Uh, histories, um, I, you know, I do scholarly things and, and whatnot, but I'm also a longtime friend of the National Park Service, and uh, it goes back a, a pretty long way, um, for me at least, uh, probably about 15 years ago. I had my first exposure with the, uh, by working with the Historic American Engineering Record, and then uh, since then, periodic encounters uh, through writing an administrative history, doing scholars' visits, um, uh, this, that, and the other thing. So this is my way of saying that uh, my comments today really filtered through the lens of, of a, a few different perspectives. Uh, I want to talk to you as a, a person who does history within a university, um, but I also want to talk to you as somebody who, who teaches people to be public historians um, uh, and, and hopefully in some cases maybe even find jobs with the National Park Service. Um, and I also want to talk to you as somebody who just loves the parks and um, who um, wants his, his young daughter, who's only two now, to also love the parks after she's simply content to play in mud puddles and, and run through the woods and whatnot. Um, at some point, I'd really like her to have the opportunity to 
to uh, be inspired by them in the same way uh, that I have been. So, so there's some framework with you. And I should also say that it's really fun to be here and see a lot of people that I've worked with in the past, um, some that I've never met in person, uh, but just by email. Um, and I also say that it's a, an incredible honor to, to hear Pat West say anything nice about my scholarship. Um, because if there is a, a public history historiography as such, um, sh her book uh, was really what turned me on to it and uh, inspired me in the first place to do much of what I've done. So it's, it's nice to be in the company of such uh, smart people. So how to make sense of all this? Um, let me just start by trying to talk about some of the, 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 um, the tweets. Oh. <laughs> This is part of my job. I, I don't know how to synthesize tweets, and, and it's probably, you know, it's a terribly analog thing for a speaker to try to synthesize tweets. So you should go do it your, you know, by yourself uh, with your smartphones or computers later on. But a couple interesting trends. Um, just a few notes that, that caught my eye. Um, uh, one person asked, boy, why is there so little diversity in this room? Um, somebody else asked, how do we go about creating advocates for the Park Service? Um, somebody asked about the role of passion. How does passion play in what we do uh, within the agency? Um, oh, what did I write here? Um, oh, somebody t talked about how to, to create better communications um, uh, within the agency and, and beyond its borders. Uh, there are some interesting comments about NPS trading cards. I guess, which I love, it's, it, which, which is a great idea and I want to know more about. What interests me about all these is that they're questions, right? And I've been involved in a couple of events like this, including one uh, at the National Council of Public History meeting in April uh, with some colleagues from Parks Canada. We wanted to talk about Imperial Promise um, and its potential for uh, implementation in an in international context. And I, we had that same phenomenon where we asked a lot of questions and got a lot of questions. Um, so, and this is a good thing, right? That's how conversation works. Although on one hand, you know, events like this, we'd love for them to produce some answers so we can go back to wherever we work and, and, and implement those things. So, so questions beginning questions, a good thing. Um, it begins conversation. Um, Another point to make is that these questions that we're getting in our Twitter feed are not terribly unlike those that, um, again, I've experienced elsewhere, especially that wonderfully hard question about diversity, right? Looking around the room, seeing a lot of uh, white folks uh, dressed well in a comfortable room. That's a, a common uh, experience in these sorts of venues. Uh, raises even more questions, right? How do we get the audience to look different? How do we have a conversation with people we're not apt to meet um, in our usual day-to-day -day world. If we talk about community engagement and take it seriously, why don't we have a bunch of rabble-rousers in the back of the room who are the community uh, who can keep us honest, right? So a lot of wonderful tweets uh, encouraging us to think critically about not only Imperil Promise, the report, but also our practice uh, to be reflexive about how we, we talk about what we do. So that, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot more smart stuff going on in, in the in Twitter verse, I think uh, Christine said. Uh, so go visit it and see what you think. <laughs> Let me move beyond tweets for a moment and, and say a few things about themes that emerged in our earlier conversations uh, from our, our speakers and that resonate powerfully, I think, with uh, Imperial Prom Promise, the report, uh, the joint NPS OEH report. Um, I've really been sort of doing this on my, my feet, so bear with me a little bit, because I'm thinking out loud and trying to play some ideas off you and see where they go. Um, but I, I did hear several powerful themes uh, from our earlier presentations I want to talk about a bit. And the first has to do with, again, what I think Christine referred to as this need within the NPS to deconstruct expertise, which is a really nice phrase. In the world of academic public history, we talk about shared authority, Michael Frisch's term uh, for, for redistrib redistributing authority. But this is I, I, taking out the world of the theoretical and putting into the world of the practical. I think what we're talking about here, a desire that's coming out of the report and that, that was voiced by this morning's speakers, is an interest in breaking down institutional and intellectual silos, right? Um, getting back to the problem of the separation between history and interpretation within the agency. 
breaking apart fundamental knowledge structures uh, that have given shape to uh, the agency's historical work over the long run. This is a really familiar conversation uh, to me as a university academic. It's something that we are talking a lot about in the university. In fact, I want to uh, share quickly an experience I had last night with uh, uh, one of our participants, Mary Rizzo. I don't know where she is. Hey, Mary. Um, so <laughs> Mary and I and a number of other people who, who were identified as public historians uh, were invited to Princeton University to talk about public history. Princeton recently discovered this new thing called public history uh, and was looking for some experts to clarify what it meant. And so we, we eagerly joined them to, to have that conversation. And what became apparent after a few minutes of, of conversation, um, there are a number of, sorry, I'm finding a place for my water. There are a number of uh, graduate students there who wanted to hear about how we came to our work. And they asked us about our backgrounds. And we went around the group and talked about our studies. And I talked about studying American studies in grad school. Mary talked about studying American studies in grad school. At least one other person talked about their American studies background. And at some point a student, Mary, Mary said this to me this morning, at some point a student said, so is it okay to study history if you want to be a public historian? <laughs> and in a way it was sort of the perfect question, right? And, and we got to talking about this a little bit and we started realizing that, and this is, um, has dovetails nicely with Wayne's comments earlier, that so many of us who are running public history programs or have found success in the field have come at it from places that weren't properly historical in definition. Um, and that says something. I think it raises an issue that is significant within the world of academic history right now. How do we define our knowledge structures? What do you need to know to do this stuff well? Um, who is our audience? How do we reach them? And what are, should our skill sets be? We're talking about that within the, within the academy. You're all talking about it too within the agency. Um, and that's why I'm so incredibly excited um, to hear, for instance, Luann uh, talk about these academies, right, that are being developed to uh, engage core questions about institutional history, um, about how the agency works, about what knowledge is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's wonderful stuff. Very exciting. It also frustrates me a little bit too because I hear these, these descriptions of these courses and I think, I want to teach those courses. Come to me at Temple and let's do this. Um, so I guess uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that um, you know, the academy and the agency have somewhat parallel histories and very similar concerns. And we've not always been so good at talking with one another for important reasons. You read Denise Marengolo's new book about this and it's really illuminating but we can help one another, right? And I think the time is, is, is right, especially because of the so-called crisis in humanities. Um, the time is right for you all to come colonize us and take over the university and tell us how we are going to restructure our history departments uh, and other humanities departments. This doesn't simply need to be a conversation about history. Uh, National Park Service could uh, be well served, I think, by thinking about public humanities as a model for uh, for, for doing interpretive work. But come tell us how to do our stuff and take advantage of our own crisis and I will uh, be happy to develop curriculum with you. So one point I, I, I want to make. A second point uh, or theme that came out of this morning's conversations uh, gets us back to this, this issue of institutional history, which again, I'm, I'm indebted to Pat West for, for getting me to think about the importance of doing this uh, thinking about institutional history, it seems to me that imperial promise points us in a direction, and I think I, I, I read you all right when I say this, where the National Park Service feels like it's time for its staff to think hard about institutional history and grapple with it and include it within its own professional training. Um, I love this idea. I want to expand it though, uh, because it seems to me that the conversation today was really about regional staff, people already doing history in, in places of power or influence uh, and how it gets done. But I want everybody in the National Park Service to understand its institutional history. And I, when I say everybody, I mean everybody from whoever is um, working in the back rooms, doing basic services, doing maintenance, up to people who are actually involved in policy making. 
And I say this for a couple reasons. I, I mentioned, I think, that I wrote an administrative history um, some years ago, and it was of the George Washington birthplace. And one of the most surprising facets of that process for me was doing oral histories with staff at the park who I discovered had absolutely no idea how their colleagues function within the context of the agency or the park. And we're often really pissed off at one another about things that seem to be really based on absolute misunderstandings. And it occurred to me that, um, boy, what if everybody had a primer and how you know, their colleagues did their work or, or how the agency worked or, or, or whatnot. So, my se sense is that um, I like this conversation a great deal. I want it expanded. I want it to empower NPS staff at all levels to respond to the inane spectacle we just saw of Congress attacking the National Park Service for not doing its job in the midst of a governmental shutdown. How do you respond to that effectively unless you understand how your agency works? a little bit about its history. We actually saw some really amazing examples of frontline folks doing that, right? And they were uh, exciting and um, you know, got me riled up. Um, I want everybody to have those tools. I, I think it's, it's absolutely necessary. That's where the passion comes in, right? That uh, people were tweeting about, uh, that I mentioned earlier on. Um, so the second, obs that, that, that was my second observation. Third, and perhaps this is a corollary, but I, I think I see this emerging out of the conversations this morning and, and, and being discussed in Imperial Promise. It's important for NPS staffers to understand their institutional history, but it's also important for park users to understand it, right? Um, and this is, you know, this gets us into the realm of, of discussing reflexivity uh, and, and parks looking in the mirror, talking about themselves with and for uh, their various audiences. And it used to be, you know, several years back that I, as soon as I would mention this possibility, I, you know, I'd get beat up all over the place and get lots of pushback um, from within the park and elsewhere, which is why I'm so excited to see Imperil Promise, because it makes me feel like my job is, like, I can go away now. You know, the argument for reflexivity has been made so well, you don't need me around. Um, but, um, but I, I, again, I'm looking for a broader vision um, and, and thinking about recent events in Valley Forge specifically, I, I, I don't know how many of you were, were following the, um, the case of the Freedom Runs out of Valley Forge, joggers that were really irritated that they had been locked out of the park and were, um, I, I guess, jumping gates or whatever and, and running around as a patriotic statement um, you know, about what nasties the, the NPS are for keeping them out of the park. What a wrong-headed thing to do, um, if, if I understand what was going on there. But what a great potential moment. These are clearly people that have this kind of passion that Barbara was mentioning earlier about the place, right? Strong feelings about the place for reasons perhaps we don't necessarily anticipate as historians, but it doesn't matter, right? They're interested in the place. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could harness that passion uh, in the service of the agency rather than in the service of uh, fringe politics? Um, I think that would be great. Therein comes that role for advocacy um, that, again, emerged in the tweets. Um, and I think we can use Imperial Promise to begin talking about in some important ways. So those are some key themes. Um, and in this way, um, you know, I, I, I simply want to rest restate what so many people have said here and elsewhere about how significant the report is. Uh, it does a lot of things really well, including articulating that very complicated uh, relationship between history and interpretation. Um, and I love the report for that reason. Uh, as I said to somebody before, you know, now I don't have to write that uh, five or six or seven paragraphs or chapter and whatever next thing I write about the Park Service. Somebody's already done it and it's, um, it's uh, eloquent and, and powerful. The report, though, is also interesting in other ways. It's been really uh, important to me in, in one way that I'll share with you. And that is, it's helped me answer a question that uh, so many of my students have asked me over the years, which is, uh, why don't you work for the National Park Service? <laughs> you love the National Park Service, you keep writing about it, why don't you just get a job there? And 
I mean, honestly, I haven't really had a good answer for that question um, until I read the report. And quite frankly, I was always a little bit upset about the fact that nobody was encouraging me to, hey, try out for this job, or, you know, there's a career for you in the agency, or, you know, and I thought, boy, they must really hate my work, or me, or some combination. Um, and maybe that's the case, I don't know. But, um, but what I've learned from the report is that there are sort of deep-rooted systemic problems that have made it very difficult uh, for the history program to um, be what it can be and to, to have the kind of self-determination that I think it needs and wants. Um, and that's been really refreshing uh, and, and um, has helped me feel a little better about myself um, and makes me, again, think that um, this is a problem of uh, folks outside the agency not understanding how it works inside, right? The report can bring that institutional, or it can show us ways to bring that institutional profile and history to a larger audience. Uh, why is that important? One, l let me make one more argument for why it is important to think about institutional history and reflexivity uh, in engaging not only agency staffers, but the public too. Um, so spring 2012, uh, I taught a course at Temple uh, concerning the history of the National Park Service. And I hope this gets offered um, regularly for a long time. It's part of Temple's Pro Ranger program with the National Park Service. Pro Ranger program uh, helps train undergraduates for careers in law enforcement within the agency. And it's a brilliant program. I want it to be bigger and better funded and more wonderful. Um, so I, I, I do anything I can do to help with that. And so I suggested at some point to the coordinator that hey, how about I teach a history of the National Park Service? Um, I do write about it after all, I'm not an expert. Uh, you all here are, are much smarter about it than I am, I, I'm sure, but I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to talk about potential law enforcement, or to talk with potential law enforcement uh, rangers about why it is they've come to be able to have that position? What, what is the agency? What's the relationship to it? What does it do? Who ultimately are they serving? Uh, in, in that position. So it, I taught this course. It was a blast. Um, it was a lot of fun. Probably the best thing about it was, when I say 2012, this was spring 2013. Yeah. The best thing about it was the timing, spring 2013, because if you remember, <laughs> we were surrounded by media coverage of the impending uh, budget sequestration. And that, I guess, hit in March, is uh, thereabouts, uh, which kind of worked very nicely within my class. Terrible for you all. Wonderful teaching moment for me. Um, so I exploited it uh, as much as I could. But what was absolutely astounding, so I, I guess the decision was made, we, we, I came in, I wanted to talk about sequestration with my students, and, and so I asked, okay, so somebody tell me about sequestration, how it's gonna impact the Park Service. There are about 30 people in this class, a small portion were per ranger folks, um, probably just about a half dozen. A lot of interested undergrads from other majors maybe one person had any sense of what sequestration meant. Um, and when I say any sense, I mean the vaguest sense, like, mm, is it related to the government? Um, is it bad? Uh, extremely, extremely vague sense. And I mean, I'm often surprised by what my students do and do not know. And my reason for bringing this up is not to critique them so much, but rather to say that this is a real problem for the agency, right? It's not just a problem of young people not being aware of current events. It's a problem of young people not understanding the basics about how the federal government works, about what the, a federal agency does, how it relates to how local units relate to larger federal units. Um, really you know, sort of basic problems with understanding how money support and, um, and, uh, and the electoral process uh, works I I in the governmental level. It occurred to me that this was, you know, I, I'm not saying that these people are a perfect sample of, of Americans, but if they're even a slightly imperfect example, it means that the challenge to make advocates of visitors is a massive one. And it's got to begin um, um, it's got to grow really in all levels, in all units, be done all the time. 
and especially with regard to training uh, people to work in, in the, the agency. I mean, it occurred to me that um, the fact that the Pro Ranger folks weren't a little more tuned into this meant that you know, we were maybe showing, you know, we were focusing on teaching students how to work in the National Park Service, but we weren't doing so good at showing them how the NPS works. Um, and, and my hope is that these academies that we've heard about are, are, are going to address those issues, and I think they will. Um, the good news is, though, by the end of that class, um, these students were pretty excited about the National Park Service, and I would even say approaching impassioned um, in, in some cases. And so I asked them, um, you know, at the end of the class, I in retrospect, why they thought NPS was significant. And this was my tricky way of kind of harvesting arguments for that moment when I came face to face with the congressman who, who yelled at me about um, not funding the agency. And what they ended up saying to me was pretty interesting. Um, and I am paraphrasing, but essentially they said they were excited about the Park Service because it seemed to them the last great hope for something that looks like um, for lack of better words, a, a kind of positive nationalism, right? A way for Americans to connect with the nation that wasn't inspired by fear, say terror or an external enemy, um, or disaster, right? But simply because the nation is great, uh, you know, for, for reasons that our parks make evident. Um, and they're very clear to me too, though, that they were really burnt out on patriotism. Um, and this is the sort of post 9-11 generation. They wanted a point of access to the nation, but they wanted it to be something that was flexible, fluid, and open to critique. That's a fairly sophisticated statement, I think, um, and a pretty good goal, um, I would suggest, for the agency as it thinks about what its history program can provide within the units moving forward. How you do that is another question. Imperial Promise certainly points uh, in some productive directions and conversations like this help us uh, along that path. Thanks so much for letting me talk with you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, so I'd like to invite um, Seth and our earlier speakers, Luann and Barbara and Wayne, uh, to come up to the front. And for about 15 minutes, we could take some questions and answers from the floor, um, if anyone has them. Um, so the, the floor is open. Any um, responses or questions from the presentations, either earlier or what you just heard? Or not? Yes, Christine. Actually, Luann, if you wouldn't mind speaking from the mic. Oh, for the camera. Yeah, right. Well, I guess I was thinking that, you know, we, one of the things about working for the agency, we always get, we're always getting these uh, emails about leadership training, which I'm always fascinated with, having not been in places where we got these invitations. But, you know, the, the agency says leadership is everywhere. And I think that while it's something of a, um, Cop out in a way that I, th you know, I was thinking as I looked at uh, the need for leadership. You know that, um, you know that it, we take some of that responsibility ourselves to try to do the best we can with what's available to us, or we create our own visions. I mean, I guess that's where I was also thinking about the role of passion, and you know, in our uh, table where we were talking about social media, we got kind of talking about the bureaucracy, and I think for many of us, we get. Um, bogged down by the bureaucracy that we work in is when we work in any large institution and I think that um, it, for me at least sometimes it really um, I really have to go to um, I really have to call upon myself to rec recreate 
the passion that I feel for doing history and that it really matters. So I think part of it is that we um, don't want to turn it into an individual <laughs> responsibility, and yet at the same time, I think that um, that, that is part of what we, we have to do and to um, insist upon people who are in positions to create change that we really insist that they, that they do that. Do you have thoughts about that since you brought, <laughs> since you raised the question? Um, so I, one of the smartest things I heard, or something that resonated most powerfully with me today was Wayne's comment about um, uh, working with the park and throwing all your grad school methodology out the window, right? That made so much sense to me thinking about the work I had done um, at the agents or at uh, Washington's birthplace. And it then worked really well for getting me a job in the academy, which is ironic, right? Um, but maybe there's a lesson in that irony and, and something that I guess concerns me a little bit about thinking about the uh, NPS academies and so forth is that I hate to see them recreate an academic model, per se, right? Because it seems to me, again, talking about that experience, talking about the American Studies model as a route for training, that actually the things that typify the history model within the academy don't necessarily work so well um, for training historians or even identifying historians. Um, so I'd, you know, I'd much rather you folks kind of move away from the old conference model of sharing knowledge and the old identifying um, um, historiographies and the old models of, of making concrete methodologies and really innovate. And it seems to me that the Park Service has this opportunity to, to become the leader in how we think about doing uh, engaged history. Um, when I was back there um, uh, working with the Park Service, um, my recollection is that um, the chiefs of interpretation around the Middle Atlantic region were like a lot older than some of you chiefs of interpretation look, look like, and that's just kind of when you're younger, everybody looks older. But um, a lot of them had come into the Park Service and came up through the Ranger series. You know, they didn't; they were not hired as historians. They were hired. And some of them had been law enforcement. Um, rangers, some of them had been kind of general interpretive rangers, and, so, and, and they brought um, not an academic perspective, but they brought, they, they brought a passion that, that's different maybe from what we've been talking about today, but they, you know, they came from the, the, the first chief of interpretation I worked for, it came out of the Everglades, I mean, almost literally, and he, he um, you know, he knew stuff that um, nobody could have gotten in books back then, and so I guess I would be a little bit reluctant to see that source of um, knowledge and um, a different kind of enthusiasm disappear in the um, kind of academicization of, of um, the process. Um, although I do think we need to have this kind of um, academic perspective. But I, I've been reminded to restate the question for the people on the live stream, sorry. Um, yes. So, so the question or the observation is about the potential for distance, distance learning with um, the training that we're speaking of. Is that, is that part of your plan?
Well, it seems maybe we're ready for some informal conversation. Um, so I, I think I will bring the um, formalities to a close here. And I just want to thank everyone so much. I hope that uh, by spending some time in this space with us today that you've met some new people, you've sparked some new ideas, and um, we, ha we can carry on um, for future gatherings just like this one. And uh, we at Rutgers Camden would be really pleased to partner with you in that endeavor. Um, so thank you. There is a reception set up in the back of the room, which doesn't help our virtual audience very much, but will be very nice for those of us who are sitting here. Um, I understand we want to do some photographs with speakers, so if our speakers would stay, the rest of you get first dibs on the table in the back. Thank you so much.